Um, let me give you guys a reference. Um, actually, if I was you, I wouldn't even read this book. <laughs> because it is a one effect. And there's all this, like, technical stuff. And Anyway, but if you're one of those people, it's called Junior. And um, I actually stumbled upon this uh, in Amazon. I don't even know how I did it, but... Um, it's a really, it's a really good book as far as what we're going to talk about today. So some of this stuff in this uh, book, it's in my notes, okay? Um, but I am really, really excited because, like we talked about last week, um, women have been given a bad rap <laughs> in the church, and God never intended it to be so. And just like we talked about how it is impossible for a man to conceive a child and carry it and birth it, so it is impossible for a woman to conceive a child and carry it and birth it herself. We have to have both. So in order for fruitfulness to be restored to the body of Christ, it's going to take men and women. Now, for those of you that want a free copy of my teaching on women, um, the CD set, I want you to put your name in this before you go, okay? And I'll get a copy for you. I'm just going to put it uh, on this chair. And it goes into all the difficult passages and stuff where, you know, women have to be silent, things like that. Um, and so we kind of went over a little bit of it uh, last week, but it really does go in depth. Now, we're going to finish Romans 16. And what I'm going to start uh, talking about when we get to um, probably the end of this month is doctrines of demons. And we're just going to start going in depth in every uh, doctrine that is preached in the church that Holy Spirit shows me that is of the devil and is not from the Lord. And there's a lot of them, believe it or not. Christians tend to be innocent as doves and not wise as serpents. And we have got to start questioning what we're hearing and getting the word of God. It's like, you know how people know counterfeit money? You know how they do that? They study the real. They study its texture. They'll fill it. They'll uh, study the markings on it. Same thing with diamonds. The way they know counterfeit diamonds is by studying the real. And so the only way that we're going to know Real doctrine is by studying the real. And then you have what I would say are half-truths, where it's like you've got some doctrine from the Bible, but it's been so watered down that it's basically not effective. Um, like we've reduced uh, the gospel of the kingdom to the gospel of salvation. Salvation is great. We want people to be born again. But the problem is that if you don't encompass all of the doctrine of the gospel of the kingdom, then you're missing out on healing and deliverance and all of that. And so when the Lord said, uh, it said that he went and preached and teached the kingdom, and then he had signs following, what he was doing was preaching, teaching, and then miracles. That's the doctrine, that's the gospel of the kingdom. And so um, I want to refresh your memory on the women that we're going to look at today. And these women were absolutely amazing in the Bible and what they did. And the gospel of the kingdom never excluded women. Man did that later. And, you know, we talked last week about the role of men and women in marriages and things like that. And there are some things men can do that we cannot and vice versa. Vice versa. So the women that we're going to discuss are Phoebe, who delivered the book of Romans to the church in Rome, Priscilla, Mary, Tryphena and Tryphosa, twin sisters, Junia, Persis, Julia, and then a sister of Marias. And so let's start with Phoebe because she's one of my favorites. Okay, um, it says in Romans 16.1, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Centuria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of 
you, for indeed she has also been a helper of many and of myself also. Now, she is a servant of the church, a helper of many, including Paul. History reveals that she was a deaconess. Okay? And she was personally mentored by Paul and ordained by him. So what that means is that he laid hands on her and ordained her for ministry because that's the only way they did it in the Bible. Okay? So they didn't vote deacons in. They didn't just say you're a deacon. It was where they laid hands on you. And the reason they did that was not for ceremony. The reason they laid hands and ordained was to impart the divine ability of the Holy Ghost to fulfill that call. So the kingdom of God is tangible. When you lay hands on people, you're literally releasing a tangible substance. You may not be able to see it, but you're definitely releasing it, and sometimes we feel it. Okay? So that's what they did. So I, mean, I don't know about you, but the Apostle Paul laying hands on me, I'd be like, shoot. You know what I mean? That's like, whew. So, and then on top of that, not only was she ordained, but she was mentored by him. Guys, I mean, come on. That is really, really cool. Mentored by the Apostle Paul. By the way, have any of y'all heard of Lance Wall now? Mm -hmm. Did you see that, Gigi, on Facebook? He liked my Facebook post. This guy, I love him. <laughs> and when I saw that he liked my Facebook post, I'm like, shut up. <laughs> what? Anyway, I just thought that in there. That was, that was my post. Huh? That was a post. It was a quote of him. That your theology should empower you. And I made a graphic and all kinds of stuff, and I've had it up there for weeks. And he He's liked like, it. Hey, this is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now another thing that Phoebe did is she housed the apostles. When Peter traveled through there, uh, they stayed at her house. So I can imagine the table conversations that they had. I mean, I bet it was incredible. Um, and so. Let me prove to you in the Greek that she was a deaconess. Uh, look at 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 12. And uh, we're going to kind of dissect a few things there, but keep your place in um, Romans. First Timothy 3, 8. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, likewise their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. Now, a lot of people say that that scripture right there actually um, eliminates women from being deacons, but that's not true. I'm going to show you that real quick. First of all, where it says that Phoebe was a servant, excuse me, the Greek word for that is deacon. Okay, so if anyone tries to say, no, she didn't serve as a deacon, you know, it was, she was just a servant. No, the original Greek, it literally says deacon. And so, um, I just want y'all to know that. The second thing is in verse 11, where it says, Likewise, their wives must be reverent. Do you see that the word there and must be is in italics? Is it in italics in your Bible? Anybody? Are y'all there? <laughs> Glenn is all looking up. <laughs> Whenever you see something in italics, it means that they added it for clarity. Okay, so that's what that's talking about. Like, for example, when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, and they said, we're, you know, we're here, he said, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus. He said, I am he. And so the New King James Law Bibles add in parentheses, he. But what that does is that takes away what he actually said. When they came to get him, he said, I am. 
And that's the name of God. Remember? So Moses said, who am I going to say that sent me? How are they going to know it's you? And he said, tell them the I am sent you. And so that name, when he released it, you know, he wasn't saying, that's me. You know, he was saying, I am. He released it. Out of his mouth came power that knocked the soldiers down. And the weird story, some of y'all have heard me teach this before, but the weird story of the naked dude in John, he's like standing around naked in the garden watching everything that's happening. <laughs> Read it. It's in there. I promise. Yeah. So they're here to arrest Jesus. He says, I am. <laughs> and then they get knocked over. And then this like naked dude is like watching and following behind, seeing everything that's going on. And they go, hey, you, are you one of, you know, one of his? And they grab his linen cloth. You know, because to them naked, I guess, is just wearing a cloth. Grab his linen cloth, and he takes off running. Now he's really naked. Okay? This is what happened, guys. If you study the original Greek, linen cloth was burial cloth. He had died when the Lord released, I am. It literally raised him from the dead. So then he's like, where am I? What is going on? And so he's trying to figure out what happened, and he sees the ruckus, and then they thought it was him. So that linen cloth, that's the only place in the only word that you will see where it refers to grave clothes. It's not, he wasn't just wearing, you know, regular clothes. It was grave clothes. Okay? So you got to sometimes read things without the italics. Like, for example, where uh, Samuel told Saul, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It's actually rebellion equals witchcraft. Rebellion is witchcraft. Stubbornness is uh, idolatry. Okay, so it's not like they're like. They are. So here, in verse 11, if you take, or 12, if you take out, um, no, verse 11, if you take out the italics, it says, likewise, wives be reverent. And we're going to include the B so it makes sense. Now, why is that important? Well, we examined last week that the Greek word for woman is also the same Greek word for wife. Um, so what they're saying is if you take the sum of truth, which we have already established last week that women have been ministers and they will continue to be ministers all throughout the history, not only of the church, but of Israel, if you take all that together, it could say, likewise, women be reverent. In other, in other words, women deaconesses. And some people and some uh, scholars believe that that does apply. Whether it does or not, I really don't need that to prove that women are deacons because we already have the Greek word that says female was a deaconess. Okay? But that's just a little something that's kind of interesting. The view of women ministers was supported by Paul, the early church, and hyster hysterical, hysterical record. Acts 6-6, uh, six, six for your notes, is where uh, it speaks about them ordaining. Uh, it says, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on uh, them. So that's exactly what Paul did with Phoebe. Uh, and then he gave her, now let me backtrack. To the early church, every position of authority held was so important that from deacon on up to apostle, they were ordained and they were laid, you know, their hands were laid on them, right? So what has happened is when the apostles died, the church began to um, appoint leaders instead of ordain leaders properly according to the Bible. And then, by the time you get to the dark ages, you could actually buy your position with money. You didn't ever have to be ordained or even appointed. And then it became a popularity contest where even today people are voted in. A lot of pastors, their voice is silenced because they know if they ever speak boldly, they could be fired. Because the congregation holds the purse strings. And a board of elders no, they have bills to pay. And so it becomes a very sticky situation. And so that's why when me and Mike founded Free Indeed and Power, we made it very clear from the start that there would be no voting in, no voting out. It would be ordination 
And the only way that you guys can get rid of me is if I fall into sin <laughs> or teach heresy. I don't see that happening, so y'all are stuck. Uh, but anyway, so that's how all of that occurred. And the idea of the honor they placed upon the office of deacon. Okay, how many of you uh, in your former churches or current churches knew who the deacons were? You did? Very good. You did? Good. Anybody else? Yeah, I didn't either. Right. I thought deacons were just, I, this sounds bad, I guess, but I thought that was just at like black churches. Is that so horrible? <laughs> I, I'm just saying, this is the only, like, when I lived in the South, when I went to like the gospel, like, and they're like, I'm deacon brother so and so, and I'm, you know, brother so and so, and blah, blah, blah. And they all have their special chairs, and I was like, okay. So does anybody know? The purpose of the deacon. <laughs> they assist. They help, and they're also in charge of distributing the funds to the poor. So it's a very uh, important office that you have to have trusted people in place. That's why if you don't let just anybody in this office, don't lay hands on anybody suddenly, is what Paul says. Because you got to have people that you trust because they're dealing with the money. Okay, and so deacons should operate miracles. They should operate miracles. Everybody from children up should operate miracles in the kingdom. And so anyway, part of Phoebe's assignment by Paul was to deliver the book of Romans to the, the, the church in Rome, the most dangerous city at the time for a Christian. So all the catacombs, that's where they were meeting. They were meeting in houses. They had like special locks and special code words. They you know, like the fish symbol. They drew that until it got too popular uh, somewhere around the door or somewhere in the ground so that Christians knew where to meet. Okay? And so he says, I want you to deliver this letter to the church in Rome. And so it's because of Phoebe that we have this book in our Bible. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I love it. Um, and you know what? To me, it's like, if women are weak mentally, you know, she probably wouldn't have done a very good job. She probably would have gotten scared or hadn't want, you know, didn't want to go or something like that. But no, she, she went and uh, she was given the most important assignment. He also called her a helper. Now, what comes to your mind when you think of a helper? Give me some feedback. What's a helper to you? The nursery, okay? Come on, it's interactive. Mm -hmm. When you're married. Huh? Greeters. Greeters. Mm -hmm. When you're married. I mean, you know, I know I'm a helper, Mike. I mean, I just do everything again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I clean them up, the clean up, the clothes, I need that engagement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let me tell you what the Greek means. That way y'all can see in a totally different light. The word helper literally means to set before, as in a leader, ruler, director, and defender of a lower person. It was one whom other people followed. Isn't that interesting? So you cleaned up vomit, got greeters and ushers, and all of those are very, very important ministries. Like the greeters and the ushers, they're the gatekeepers. They guard the presence of the Holy Spirit. So I am not in any way downplaying their importance to the church. But I am saying that a lot of the ideas of the positions and ranks in the church uh, that we have today are completely inaccurate and way below what the Bible had them at. So that means that Phoebe was a ruler, she was a director, she was a defender of the lower person, and she was also a ruler, so she had rank. And it also means, in Thayer's Greek definitions, a woman set over others, a female uh, guardian, a protectress, caring for the affairs of others and aiding with her resources. In other words, she was Paul's assistant, and one of her duties, now this is from historical record, was to attend to new female converts and get them ready for baptism. That was her job. She was to visit the sick and those in prison and attend to all the parts of church work that could not be performed by men. Isn't that amazing? She was a person of rank. 
Now let's go to the next one. I just want, I, you know, every man in this place, I can vouch for and say that they honor women. I mean, I've seen Gigi, I know Michael does, I've seen how his family is, how he interacts with his wife, I know Mike does. What I want you guys to leave with today is that there are no limitations on you. And I want you to leave with an understanding of the, the trust that God puts in you. And that he has called you to things greater than you realize. And to carry yourself with that dignity. Because there is nothing inferior about a woman. Except she can't lift 207 pounds. Okay? Alright, so let's look at uh, Priscilla. Uh, and Aquila. Verse 3 in Romans 16. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fe uh, fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life. To whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Now, what on earth? Okay? And then it says in verse 5, Likewise, the church that is in their house, greet my beloved, whoever that is, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Now, that is Asia. So, speaking of the Asian church, Priscilla and Aquila are a husband and wife team. Okay? Now, uh, and I mentioned this last week. The Greek custom is that whatever um, person in a team that holds the highest rank, their name is said first. And so there's one place where Aquila is said first in the book of Acts. And later, as their ministry develops, you see Priscilla uh, from then on. Her name is being said first. So that means that she was actually the more dominant minister in the husband and wife team. Not dominant over her husband. She just had more uh, ministry that she was doing. They also had a house church. So more than likely, she was the lead pastor. Okay? Um, and what, uh, basically, these two were from Italy. And they went to Corinth after Emperor Claudius ordered all Jews expelled from Rome. They were fellow tent makers, and that's how they met Paul. Okay? And historical records reveal that they were also possibly part of the original 70. So you have women and men as the original 70. So here we've got a house church led by a woman. Okay? And then let's go on. Um, it, and y'all know I'm not, like, it's hard talking about women in ministry because I don't want to sound like a feminist. <laughs> you know, so I hope y'all are hearing that I'm not in any way dishonoring men, and I'm not, it's, you know, let's not burn all the bras and grow armpit hair. That is not what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. I can grow armpit hair anyway because I have my laser zapped. But you know what I'm saying. All right. Uh, verse 6. Greet Mary who labored much for us, Greet uh, Andronicus and Junia, love this one, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Now, who exactly are those people? Okay, Mary was another uh, a female worker in the church, and the phrase who labored much is a Greek phrase that is repeatedly used of the exhaustive, extensive, intensive labor of the apostles. So this is a woman who worked just as hard as the apostles, okay? I mean, these guys, that scripture, you know, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in me, he'll quicken my mortal body. They literally had to live by that or they would have died of exhaustion, okay? And so she worked just as hard. But here's where we get to the very interesting thing when it comes to um, uh, Junior. Well, actually, let me read you Romans 16, 6 and the least. Greet Marian, who is such as to have labored with wearisome effort to the point of exhaustion on your behalf with reference to many things. And so that's referring to her. Now, here we've got Andronicus and Junia, countrymen, fellow prisoners, who are known among the apostles. Who the heck is this? Okay. This is where things get a little bit tricky. In the original manuscripts, it was always Andronica, Andronicus and Junia. And there was a deliberate change 
to a male name, Virginia, in the Middle Ages. And they renamed Junia to Junius, J-U-N-I-A-S. Historical documents show that the reason they did that is it was impossible for a woman to be an apostle. Okay? So all the ancient manuscripts show Junia. But because men did not believe women could be apostles, they changed it to a male name. Now, Junia is a female name, and in all Greek texts, there is not one single reference to a genius because that name did not exist. It was not a male name. No one was ever named genius. Isn't that interesting? So they made up this Greek name and said it had to be a man because women cannot be apostles. And so they actually felt it was shortened form genius of J-U-N-I-A-N-U-S. And there is no reference to that name in all of the Greek manuscripts that have been discovered so far either. Do you see how far the religious spirit will go <laughs> to change church history? So this started in the Middle Ages. So what happened is women were cut out. Uh, they continued to hold church services in Latin. The Bible was chained to altars in churches. People were illiterate, and before you know it, the Dark Ages came. Okay? And I know I'm giving you a lot of history. It's not normal, but I want you all to see what's happened. And so, in 1998, so Middle Ages, it was not until 1998, guys, that people began to put Junia back in the Bible. What, what, what verse is Junia mentioned? Verse 7. No, Romans 16, 7. 1998. <laughs> That's ridiculous. All because women cannot be apostles. And that belief is still very prevalent today. They, you know, women, that is just impossible. They cannot be. You'll see in commentaries and Bible dictionaries that a lot of them wrestle over this question because it's impossible for a woman to be an apostle. To this day. Get you a commentary, you'll see it. So who exactly were these two? Andronicus and Junia were a brother and sister ministry team that were actually relatives of Paul. Historical records show that they were part of the original 70. They were born again before Paul was. So while Paul was going around killing and arresting Christians, they were some of those that believed. So think about that the next time you have maybe one of those difficult holiday dinners with family. <laughs> and just think, at least we're not Saul. <laughs> so you can imagine that they were praying for him, that they, you know, I firmly believe that Paul was born again because he had family that was born again that was praying for him. Okay? And so they were his relatives, and they served time in jail with him because of their faith of Jesus Christ. So they ministered very closely with him. And they were apostles of note. And so that means, guys, that they knew Jesus in the flesh before Saul ever met him on the road to Damascus. Isn't that neat? And so of note means distinguished, eminent, and well thought of. So, Junia is not a dude. She's a dudette. Okay? <laughs> a dudette. All right. Um, greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord, Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and I don't know who that person is, my beloved. Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my countryman. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus. Can you imagine that name? Who are in the Lord. And here we go, the next females. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mom. Okay, Tryphena and Tryphosa, can you imagine <laughs> They believed they were twins because their names were so closely together. So they're probably uh, twin uh, girls, but they were sisters who labored in the Lord together. 
And uh, what many don't realize is that the word deaconess or bishop s that's how they uh, would say it in the original Greek. It's they add a letter, they add something to the, the Greek word to make it female. Um, it was used to describe Mary that we read about earlier and Trifina and Trifosa. So more than likely, they were bishops in the church. A bishop, guys, is an elder. They're interchangeable, the same thing. Okay, so that means there were women elders. Okay, so we've got pastor, we've got apostle, we've got elders, we've got deacons. All right? And it also says that they uh, had the same apostolic work and toil to exhaustion as Mary did. And historical records have these two as marketplace evangelists. Is that not amazing? Trifina and Trifosa, twin sisters who were marketplace evangelists and leaders in the church. Persis, that sounds like a disease. Persis was a leader of the Roman church and committed for her uh, diligent service. All right, so then it goes, you know, Greek, A, verse 14, A, P, Hermes, P, Hermes, and the brethren are with them. Greek, uh, I, I say his name in verse 15, and Julia, Marius, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another the holy kiss, the churches of Christ greet you. So that fellow dude and Julia, they were more than likely a husband and wife team of a house church, and some believe that he was the father of Nereus and Olympus. And so you see that not only was Nereus and Olympus workers, but their sister was as well. And Paul probably just couldn't remember the name. So he said the sister of Nereus. Um, now, I hope you see that in just this little bit, how many women is it? Nine or ten women that he greets and names as women that are very much prominent in the church of Jesus Christ. What are they saying? No, just no. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to say that. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, let's look at Philip, the evangelist. Philip, he's the one that started out as a deacon. He uh, goes to Samaria. He starts a revival. Peter and John go down to uh, uh, give the baptism of the Holy Ghost to the new disciples. Remember the whole sorcerer, you know, and he wanted to pay for the Holy Spirit and all that stuff, okay? Then Philip leaves Samaria, and he sees this Ethiopian dude studying the book of Isaiah. He runs and catches up with his chariot, okay? Uh, that was supernatural, guys. So he's running alongside. Hey, what's up? Is he reading Isaiah? Got some questions? <laughs> so they stop it. He gets on. He explains it. Delivers some good news. <laughs> delivers the good news. The Ethiopian's like, there's water here. Let's take care of business. Okay. And so they go in the water. He comes up. Poof. Philip's gone. You don't hear Philip. He's translated. All right. Until 20 years later. And he has settled in Caesarea, and he has four virgin daughters who were all prophetesses. Now we've got prophetesses. Okay? Evangelists, prophets, apostle, pastor, and we all know women can teach. We're full of words. Okay? And I, and I can give you all examples of that too. I can prove in the Old Testament, and I've proven tonight in the New Testament, that uh, women have served in every role of leadership, including commanding armies. That was Deborah, and she was a judge. And then the scripture that says, how beautiful are the feet of those who carry the good news. The uh, language of that in the uh, Aramaic Hebrew is speaking of females, because again, they had... Uh, the same word had male and female, kind of like Spanish, niño and niña. Uh, they just changed some things, right? And that's about my extent of you know, Spanish. You know, see, hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> okay. Um, now let's look. Uh, so before we move on, before we finish Romans, do you guys have any questions on that or any thoughts 
on women's role. So it's just the one apostle that was named the one woman. There was no Jane. Mm -hmm. Well, now there are more women apostles, but they're not recorded uh, in here. Yeah, I mean there might be some more in here, but as far as Romans 16, I was the only one. Okay, now we're going to shift gears and we're going to finish off Romans. Uh, let's look at verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ with their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all, therefore I am glad on your behalf. But I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now did you ever see that? The God of peace will crush Satan under your feet in that context? It's like why the heck are you talking about divisions and offenses and stuff and the God of peace will crush Satan shortly under your feet? So this is so important. Um, the Greek word note means to mark, goal, and spy. Okay, so a lot of you have heard me say, when Kent was in youth, I would be running all over that church, making sure girls would stay away. <laughs> Especially I want to sw you know, swing her hips when she walks. I'm like, you're going to throw out your back. You're getting, seriously, you're going to need surgery when you get over it. And, uh, man, when I saw her on the move, I'm like, brother, get in between them, you know. He's like, Mom, you're being an idiot. You've got to quit. I'm not attracted to her, blah, blah, blah. you got to quit. Even the youth pastor's like, what are you doing? I don't have time to talk. <laughs> and so I was spying it out. I was marking and I was noting those that were predators that were after people in the church. And what I find amazing is a lot of people, uh, let me phrase it this way, Christians can be some of the most naive people on the planet. Okay? Because we just have this idea that whoever you're in church with is a Christian. No. We also have this idea that every person that's a pastor is a Christian. No. <laughs> I mean, you can go down the list. John Wesley and his brother, on the boat coming over, realized that they were not born again. Did y'all know that? Have y'all heard the story? There were these... <laughs> See ya. There, there were these um, Germans that were coming over to America. They found a Moravian Falls. They had prayer 24-7 for 100 years. They're on the boat. John and Charles have already started the Methodist movement in England. They were already known for that. They were very methodical thanks to their mom, Susanna. So they're on the boat. And in John's words, he's seeing the Germans just praising and singing hymns to God while the boat is going down in this tremendous storm. So John Wesley goes up to him and he taps the leader on the arm, kind of like you know, I told my nephew a child molester is coming to pick up the computer. So I think it was kind of like that same thing. So he taps him on the shoulder and he says, Sir, you do realize that the boat is sinking, right? Because he thought they were, uh, how did he phrase it? Uh, mentally retarded. That's basically what he thought. And they didn't understand what was happening. It seems right. They didn't understand. And they're like, well, yes. And so he's like, well, how do y'all have all this peace? And he said, well, we're Christian." And he's like, what must I do to be saved? Already started a denomination. Already started a Christian movement. And he's not born again yet. Okay? So, a lot of damage has been done by us not allowing the Holy Spirit. Or, when he warns us of somebody, we dismiss it. Okay? Or we'll go the other extreme and we won't like them. That's not what is happening. What he's trying to do is to get you to understand that person is uh, possibly dangerous. Be careful. Don't give your confidence to them. Don't put your trust in them in any way. And pray. I cannot tell you how many people I have ministered with 
that the Lord has shown me specific things that I knew if they did not change would end up severing the ministry relationship and even possibly them falling later. Okay? But it doesn't mean I go up to them and say, you're greedy, your wife's an idiot, and your kids, man, let's put some clothes on the girl here. You know what I'm saying? I don't do that. Okay? Because that's not my role. And so my role, if you want to know my role, this is my role everywhere I go. I finally realized it and it just embraced it. My role is to expose and challenge, and I do it by accident all the time. Okay? And so that seems to happen. All right. So it needs to spy out. Now, when you see people specifically going into a congregation, going into a Christian gathering or whatever it is, and they start selling gossip, and I don't agree that, you know, can't win this for day, blah, 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 and then you have this, all this little stuff going on, that's the person you're supposed to note. That's the person you're supposed to spy out on. Okay? I know it sounds weird, but that's what it means. Note those. Spy them out. See where they're causing division. Because a lot of times, the leader of that group is so focused on what God is doing, they often do not see what's going on behind the scenes. And then they get blindsided by half their congregation leaving. Okay? And so that's where a lot of church... Uh, splits. Wow. It's like I read. I mean, it just has a big stink and it goes all over the place. Oh my God. <laughs> Ooh. All right. So divisions is dissension. Now, what this refers to, I think I'm blushed. Okay. It refers to a factious spirit. It's the political spirit. If you want to know what it looks like, just examine our country right now. That is the exact spirit that is operating, and it's what will come into churches. And so people will like, well, I'm on that person's side. Well, I'm on this person's side. And before you know it, there's this big split, this big gulf between the members because the enemy knows if he can destroy unity, he can destroy that church because a house divided cannot stand. And that's what he's doing on the page. Okay? That's why he's doing it. And his most favorite uh, use is political correctness. Everybody has to apologize. I'm sorry for saying that all lives matter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but let's get off of politics. All right. Often a person like this will form cliques and parties that side with each other and they'll separate one another and they'll use offense and gossip causing church splits. Okay, I've seen this several times. I've seen it in the furnace. I take note of those people and I watch them and I just see how they progress. Some of y'all know y'all been on the, you know, not the receiving end, but y'all been in on it. Y'all know what's going on, right? And then, sure enough, this well do. I used to pray them out. I'm like, get them out. I don't want them here anymore. I don't want them in the furnace. But now, I've switched, like I told y'all, that they'll stay long enough to get what they need. And if they're not going to, don't let the door hit you where the good Lord splits you. You know what I'm saying? So, exit signs, also be able to right there. You know, if you need to go, you can go. I would rather that God do his weeding process, which he seems to do every summer, so y'all are safe for a year. <laughs> he, he has this weeding process, and then what happens is there's quality growth. Okay? Because we got weeds, they'll suck the nutrients and the moisture that's needed uh, for the plants. Okay, now, um, they serve their own, oh, well, hang on for one second. The main weapon we see that they use to cause division separations based on doctrine. And they say, or Paul says, to avoid or turn away. You're not supposed to hang out with those people. Okay? Because deception, the problem with it is you don't know you're deceiving. Okay? So that's, you know, you got to be careful. They serve their own belly. What the heck does that mean? By good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. Belly refers figuratively, figuratively to the heart. In other words, they have a specific desire and agenda of the heart 
that brought them under bondage, and then they'll try to bring other people under bondage. So this is a person that maybe they want a certain position in the church, they've never gotten it, so they'll go to another church because they're going to get in that position. You know, or whatever it is, they have a specific thing, and everything they do is to serve that desire. Have you ever met anybody like that? Okay. Um, then what happens is when sound doctrine is taught, because apostolic doctrine is not dessert. Okay. I mean, I can be up here teaching or preaching something, and I'm being convicted. <laughs> you know, like, oh, this is so hard. <laughs> and so uh, the thing is, is it, it always challenges. Uh, apostolic doctrine requires change. You can't just go and listen to it and think you're going to get away with the same. Okay? Because number one, God will repeat himself. Like with Kent, you know, when he was little, I would just, you know, repeat myself and then repeat myself and repeat myself and then repeat myself. You know, just over and over. Wear your seatbelt, wear your seatbelt, wear your seatbelt, wear your seatbelt. Like <laughs> we're in the car. That's what the Lord does. And then after a while, when we harden our heart, he won't say anything. So then we start getting the spankings. So what happens is when sound doctrine is preached, a person that is serving their own belly will get offended, okay? And they'll begin to sow the seeds of strife among the people. That's usually how it happens. The way they do that is good words and spare, spare speeches. Fair speeches. And so in other words, what they are saying sounds right and it sounds fair. So that's where it can get a little tricky. Well, I mean, they were kind of, you know, and before you know it, you can be agreeing with what they're saying and not even realize. Now, when it says uh, to deceive the hearts of the simple, what that means, guys, is it doesn't mean simple as in mentally, you know, challenged or a low IQ. That's not what it means. It is talking, it's what I was talking about earlier, that there are Christians that simply do not think bad. You know, like they take people at their word. They like people. And so they don't, like, it doesn't enter their mind that this person could be intentionally sowing strife. Okay, so that's what that means. And so two things will keep you safe. And if you're taking notes, you might want to write it down. Be wise in that which is good. That's the first thing. And simple concerning evil. Now, what does it mean, wise concerning what is good? Biblical uh, wisdom has several characteristics. Number one, it's God-centered. And so when you're hearing someone that's attacking another person, I guarantee you that's not God-centered. Okay? Number two, it carries the idea of fear of God. See, there's two roads on the side of life. It's uh, fear of God and love of God. It's the kindness of God, the severity of God. If you will stay in between those two things, know the lion and the lamb, then you'll be safe. It's when we get over to that God's love, he loves everybody, you know, the hippie. <laughs> Elizabeth. Uh, so if you get to the hippie side, okay, you're going to allow people to just, you know, take advantage of you. You're going to enable them to see my behavior. But then you can be on the other side, which is very strict, it's all about the fear of God. He's going to get you. And so then, you know, you're in a ditch as well. So here's the way I look at it. God loves me. I love him. Every time he hears my voice, he's happy. That's how he is with you guys. Every time he sees my face, he smiles. But I also know that he is to be honored and deeply respected. And so God wisdom has the fear of God in it. And so whenever someone starts talking and they're so strike and you get that little, mmm, something's wrong here, that more than likely is the Holy Spirit to, you know, whoa, this is not honor, this is not reverence, okay? How can we call it out? Because sometimes people do this out of ignorance. Right. And you want to have the love for them and be like, hey, you know, you're acting ignorant right now. This isn't actually who you are. Well, one thing that I would do is um, whenever, like sometimes people need to vent. So it really depends on the context of the situation. So if, like, for example, I'm very close with my friend, and she works in youth, and so she sees things that frustrate her. So when she's sharing with them with me, she's not in any way causing dissension, strife, or division. And so what she's doing is she wants to talk it out and get counsel. But if someone is gossiping, 
or they're getting, like you can feel it, you can hear it in their voice. There's a hostility. There's an offense there. When they're doing that, what I have been in the past to say, I am not comfortable with this conversation. And usually that's after repeatedly defending the other person. Well, maybe they're doing this because of this, or have you spoken with them? Have you had communication with them? So if they still refuse to stop, then you have to get away from them. I mean, the Bible is clear. They're now doing it knowingly if you've called them out on it. And uh, so it says to turn away. Now, um, that's a good question. It's also, biblical wisdom has an understanding of how God works. So if you don't understand how he does things, if you don't understand his ways, then you may not be able to recognize when the enemy is using someone to cause division. And then the word simple, or good, let me, let me do good first, means that which is profitable and useful. So is the, is the conversation profitable and useful to your life? If it's not, every idle word will be judged, right? So how will the end it? And then the word simple means without mixture. That's all that means. Your heart's pure. And so you're not on the fence. You're, you know, you're straight up God. And so um, there's a lot of people, especially in the prophetic, that have mixture. You see it all the time. They've got a gift. They can prophesy, but their character is lacking. And so what happens is there might be greed there, there might be jealousy there, there might be an adulterous heart, whatever it is, but they can dazzle everybody with their prophecy, but the prophecy is tainted. Okay? And so that's what mixture means. Now let's look at 21. Uh, so he says, Amen, right? So, uh, Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So you think it'd be over. But then he says, Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my countrymen, greet you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church, greet you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greet you. And Cordus, the brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Okay. All right. Amen. Now, he reminds me of my grandpa and my dad. Do you know those people that you're trying to leave and you're working your way out of the door <laughs> and they keep talking, right? And then you're like, well, I gotta, I gotta go.